Lord, may they be pleasing in your sight today.
Almighty God, we serve that in His holiness and His righteousness, He still allows He still allows these sinless vessels to cry on the name of the Lord and to be saved. For we are sinful, for we are faithless. But Lord, I thank you that you bestow your faith, that your faithfulness to us. So, Lord, as we lift high the name of Jesus this morning, as we say that his name is worthy to be praised, that lamb that was slain to be taken to take away the sins of the world, God, may our hearts be drawn near to you. Lord, may our hearts be drawn near to the one who gave us life. And, Lord, may that light shine bright in this place this morning. Lord, worthy is the name of Jesus to be praised. Lord, we lift you up and say thank you for the salvation that we have. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God that is living in us and all around us, Lord, may it speak clearly to our hearts this morning of our need for a Savior this morning. God, we love you, and we celebrate who you are today. In Jesus' precious, amazing, and worthy name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is it, is it good to be in worship this morning? And you know how, like, I'm not looking for false response. That's, I, I really want to know, is it good to be in worship this morning? Because I, I think sometimes, I know Larry's not here, right? And you need, you need that Larry amen over there. I saw Paula was taking up for him. It was good. He'd be so proud of his daughter-in-law. And uh, listen, it's good to be in, in worship. And sometimes we come to worship, um, but really our heart is somewhere else. Our mind is somewhere else. And, and we wonder, is there any benefit to being in worship? Is there, is there any real reason that we should regularly come to worship? You know, and, and here's kind of the idea of, of where we're headed this morning. I want to give you three stories of worship. That's why I have uh, our, our friends, I got Jamie and Aaron up on stage. They're going to give you stories of worship here in just uh, a little bit because I believe that God is doing something as we regularly gather as his people to worship him. If you're a guest with us this morning, we've been going through a series called Clough Life, and it's just the idea of what is God calling us to do together? Who is God calling us to be together as the body of Christ here at Clough Pike Baptist Church? And when we think about gathering together for worship, our minds normally go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. It's normally what we think about when the Bible says that we're not supposed to neglect gathering together for worship. As a matter of fact, I'll just go ahead and read these scriptures as we begin and we'll pray and we'll get moving into where God is calling us to be as a people gathered in his name to worship him. But here's what the author of Hebrews wrote. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25. He writes, and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Here is what God is saying. Actually, we're going to pray and then we'll get to that. Father God, we'll just come to you this morning and we want to lift up your name. Lord, we are your people and we are here uh, to celebrate who you are. We're here to lift up the name of Jesus. We're here to say we want to glorify you in all that we do, not just as we gather in this place, but as we leave this place. God, we want to glorify you with all of our lives. God, will you work in your people, have your will and your way in us this morning, and we will give you praise because we know it is you who it's due. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just to, to think about that verse that we just read. This verse that says that we are to not neglect gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. We look at what that passage is saying because there's great encouragement in coming together as the body of Christ. There's supposed to be great encouragement in coming together as the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, when we are feeling down and we come together as the body of Christ, we realize that we're not the only one who is feeling down and that the, we can pray for one another and that we can encourage one another and we can remind each other of the victory that we have in Jesus, Lord, just victory for this life, victory over sin, victory over death, and victory for all of eternity, praising and singing his name. And uh, we realize that when we are having times of celebration, you know what? It's not fun to throw a party by yourself. 
I, that's just me. I know that there's some introverts in the crowd that might disagree, right? But it's not fun to throw a party by yourself. I want to talk to other people. I was told this past week that I could talk to a wall, and that's probably true, all right? But I would rather talk to a person than talk to a wall. I like being together, and when I have something that is going on good in my life, when God has blessed me in some way, my natural reaction is to share. It. As a matter of fact, just think about it this way. When was the last time something good happened in your life? What was your first instinct? You know, for me, when something good is happening in my life, I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to call Mandy. I'm going to call my mom, still a mama's boy after all these years, right? I am going to share what is happening in my life. There is encouragement in coming together as the body of Christ. And here's the thing. This is exactly what God has created us to do as the people of God. He has created us to come together together in the presence of God, worshiping him, you know, bringing glory to him. I love quoting the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It simply says this, the chief end of man. In other words, the reason that people were designed, the reason that you and I were created, the chief end, this is the crux of who we are. The chief end of man is to glorify God, to know and to enjoy him forever. God has called us to enjoy him forever. God has created us for worship. I want to show you this in Exodus. I'm sorry, not in Exodus. We were in Exodus earlier this year, but in Genesis, we'll go back a little bit further. See, in Genesis chapter 1, I'll look at verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. We go to Genesis chapter 2. God is talking again, and it says, then and the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. Here's what's going on when we read the creation account in Genesis. We see that man is made in the image of God. He's made in the likeness of God. And then in Genesis chapter 2 it says that man is filled with the spirit of God. We look at this and all this points to we are to reflect God's goodness and glory. Let's summarize it up people. We were created to worship. We were created to bring glory to our God and our Savior. And if that isn't good enough for you, I want to give you three reasons. We're going to share three stories this morning that are going to point to why it is good for the body of Christ to regularly gather as the church to worship him. And so here I'm going to allow Jamie to come and to share our first story this morning. Thanks, Josh. You know, this morning I got a text from Josh and Aaron, a selfie of them together, telling me to wear a shirt just like them. But I, uh, I, would, I didn't pick out my shirt yet, but uh, I decided not to do that. That'd be a little strange. Today I'm going to share a story, uh, probably one of the most impactful um, stories in my mind about worship. It comes out in Nehemiah 8. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there really quick. Uh, I imagine you'll be thumbing around a lot today because we're each going to share a little bit different stuff. Uh, today is a story that I bring you about the supremacy and the joy of the Word of God in our worship. Um, and if you turn to Nehemiah 8, I'll give a little bit of an overview and we'll really hit verses 8 through 12 hard. Um, what we see here in Nehemiah 8 is that these people come together, the people of God come together and tell Ezra to bring out the law of Moses, the word of God. And they stand there from sunrise to noon. They listen attentively to the word and they worship God together. We see them standing in reverence to the reading of God's word. They stand up as the word is read to them. They lift their hands in worship and they respond by saying amen. Simply put, they're worshiping God here. That's what they're doing in this moment in Nehemiah 8. And then in verse 8, we see this. <clears throat> this is the Levites that are doing this. They are reading from God's word. It says in verse 8, They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. They gave sense to it. They, they explained it. They were preaching God's word to the people in verse 8. They were telling what it's, saying clearly, and it impacted these people emotionally. It, it caused a reaction, because in verses 9 and 10, 
we see that, the, that Nehemiah tells them, he says, this day is holy, in verse 9. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. And then in verse 10, he told them to go and, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Then in verse 11, we see the Levites calming the people as well. These are priests of the people, and they say, Be quiet, be still, for this is a holy day. Do not weep. And then in verse 12, we see something magnificent. The people go away. All the people went their way, it says, to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. When we gather here today, when we gather here today, we need to remember why. So let me ask you this. Why did you come to church this morning? Was it for us, for the matching shirts and, and, uh, and the amazing worship? Was it for your friend next to you? What was it for? Was it for the padded pews or the AC, the entertainment on stage? You got to ask yourself this question. Why did you come this morning? Because coming here should be for the God that we worship. The God revealed to us in the word of God. The God revealed to us in his holy Bible. The God who formed you in your mother's womb, who knew your name, who knows you, knew your name before you were even a twinkle in your mother's eye. That is a God that we came to worship. That is a God we love. The God who cared so much about you that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, a life that none of us could live, and to die on the cross for our sake. So that you, with your imperfections and your sinfulness in your life, can now be made right with God. That's what he did. He loved us and gave us a new life, a life bought with his sacrifice, a life that is gifted to us in his resurrection and sealed by the Holy Spirit. This is the central purpose of the book that we read from the Holy Bible. This is the reason why we're gathered. See, worship stems from a reverence and a love of the word of God. So when we come here today, it's because of this. It's not because you, you love to hear Josh preach or Aaron sing, and I love that. Don't get me wrong, that's great. But it's the word of God itself explained to us and brought out through song, through singing, through preaching. That is what we see here in Nehemiah 8, this beautiful picture of what the word of God is. And you need to find joy in that. So ask yourself, do you find joy? a true happiness in the word of God? Do you find a true joy when you gather here today to worship him? A joy that stems from the Bible? If you do, if you do find that joy, continue in that joy throughout your day, throughout your life. Enjoy Christ. Love him. But if the word doesn't inspire a true, joyful worship, Later on, you're going to have an opportunity to find that joy at the end of the sermon. The, the Bible is a manifestation of God's love, and his love should bring you happiness, true happiness, true joy in him. Today is the day that we set aside all our grief and, and rest in that peace of God, which transcends all understanding. And this is what Nehemiah 8 shows us, that we should not weep on this day of worship, but instead joyfully Praise the Lord. This is the day to do that. And as Psalm 118.24, I love this verse. It says, <clears throat> This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I, I went to seminary for a lot of things, and one of the things I hated was the languages. Am I right? <laughs> they, they're, they're tedious. But let me tell you, when you look at this verse in the original Hebrew, in Psalm 118.24, it says, It. Let us, let us be glad and rejoice in it. That's ambiguous in the Hebrew. It can refer to a number of things. It can refer to the day, 
Let's rejoice in the day that God has given us. Or it could refer to God himself, the Lord. So a valid translation is this. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in him. We could say that. That's completely okay. So today, this day that is a holy day, set aside by God, don't grieve. Don't weep. Rejoice. Find joy in him, in his word. Not in this day only, right? Not, in, not today only, but in the ancient of days, every day of your life. Rejoice in the king of heaven. Find joy just as the people did here in Nehemiah 8. Find joyful worship because of the word of God. Now, this is only one picture of worship in the Bible, and uh, it's a powerful story, isn't it, about the joy we get from the Word of God. But now, you, you should know that the Word of God, even though it brings us joy and it brings us to joyful worship, it also warrants a powerful response from God's people, which Josh is going to show us now. Thanks, Jamie. Now, I, I read the quote by C.S. Lewis. I love reading C.S. Lewis. Actually, our, our family just finished reading uh, Chronicles of Narnia uh, together. And uh, so The Lion, the Witch, and, and the Wardrobe, really, just uh, reading that with my boys, it was a whole lot of fun. But I, I read a quote by C.S. Lewis, and it, it talked about joy being the serious business of heaven, right? Like, listen, uh, joy is serious business in heaven. And, and I love this implication when we think about what God has called us to. He's called us out of death and into life and to eternal life. And eternal life doesn't start when we die, does it? No, eternal life is now. Now that we have Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. And so we ought to take very seriously joy right now. Joy of the Lord being our strength. Joy in gathering together as a community of believers. And, and yes, the Word of God gives us great reason to celebrate because of what it says about who God is. I think Aaron quotes quite often as we uh, talk about worship. Worship is our response to who God is and, and what He has done for us. Has God done good for us? For you? If the answer is yes, then we ought to worship with excitement and with great joy. And as we come together and worship, the second picture of what worship calls us to, I'm going to read out of 2 Kings chapter 22 and just a little bit in chapters 23, because I believe that God also, when we come together and, and gather around the, the word of God together, that it also continues to do something else for us. When we look at 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23, we find one of my personal favorite stories of Scripture. Isn't that really nice that when you go to Scripture, you can have a lot of favorite stories? Because I think you guys hear me say that a lot. I get into the Word of God, and it starts speaking. I go, yes, this is like my favorite story until next week, and then I'll have a new one. But this is one of my favorite stories for this week, so listen up, right? And in 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23, we encounter King Josiah. If you don't know anything about King Josiah, King Josiah came to the throne when he was eight years old, okay, adults, I have a seven-year-old. Imagine that crazy little Kai dude being the governor over, you know, all of Israel. That's scary to think about. Yet God <laughs> brought about in his goodness and his good timing the right person to the throne. As a matter of fact, King Josiah had a heart for the Lord and he began to rebuild the temple. And we have uh, his high priest Hilkiah in, in chapter 22 and verse 11. It says that he brings the word of God to King Josiah. And so King Josiah hears the word of God and his response to the word of God in this particular instance was not one of celebration. As a matter of fact, it was one quite opposite of celebration. He was repentant because he saw what the word of God said and he saw how he didn't measure up. And so he tears his clothes and he weeps in his, and he mourns and he commands the high priest Hilkiah to go back to the temple, back to the presence of the Lord and beseech the Lord on behalf of the king and on behalf of Israel to have mercy and grace on them. In verse 19 of chapter 22, Hilkiah comes back and he responds with what God responds to him as he was praying on behalf of King Josiah and Israel. Verse 19, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord, 
when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes, that's repenting and wept before me, I myself have heard you. And this is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, I will indeed gather you to your fathers and you will be gathered to the, your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I am bringing on this place. Then they reported that to the king. So for going into chapter 23, it says, So the king sent messengers and they gathered all the elders of Judea and Jerusalem to him. Then the king went to the Lord's temple with all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem as well as all the priests and the prophets and all the people from the youngest to the oldest. And he read in the hearing of all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Next the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant in the Lord's presence to follow the Lord and to keep his commands his decrees and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul, referring to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and the Shema, in order to carry out the words of the covenant that were written in the book. And here is the response. Don't miss it. It was not just that the king did this and that the people went, okay, that the king is doing this. In other words, right, it is not just that the pastor says something and the church goes, okay, well, if the pastor's good for it, you know, we'll kind of sort of maybe half-heartedly follow around, along. This is what the word of God says, and all the people agreed to the covenant. Here's what happens when we gather together and worship. Yes, when we gather together and worship, it is a time of great celebration. It is a time of great joy. But it is also a time when we gather together as a body of Christ that we are coming as the people of God before the presence of God. And when we go before the presence of God, we encounter the holiness of God. And when we encounter the holiness of God, we realize that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when we realize that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, it requires us to repent, to once again get right with God. And when we repent that we might be right with God, we experience the grace of God and then we leave walking out together, all together in the forgiveness of God. Now we might go out and accomplish the plan and the purposes of God. See, regular worship, it coming together to regularly worship, it is celebratory. And it is also in counting the presence of God that he might change us. I love the prayer of John the Baptist, that he might become greater and we might become less. That we would become more and more created and molded and shaped into the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what God does in us if we will commit to regularly come together as the people, agree with him, and allow him to have his way in our lives. This is the second story. I'll allow Aaron to come and to share this third story of what God does as we gather together as his people. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to talk about worship, and obviously as the creative arts pastor, that should be easy for me, but the funny thing was Josh asked Jamie and me to come into his office, they're like, so what would be a story that talks about the need for us to gather and worship? So if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter four, 14, is where I'm going to share a story from. And where this story brings us is, obviously Jamie talks about the joy, Josh speaks about this need for it, and this this this, what happens when they, when we come together. But what I want to talk about briefly is in first Corinthians chapter 14, the people of God gathered together for worship. So do not forsake the gathering of the, 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 the saints, this idea. They got together in, in, in 14. We, we see in verses 23 and 24 said the whole church assembled together. And they, if they speak in tongues and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that they are mad? But if a pro all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he will be convicted by all. He is called to account by all, and the secrets of his heart will be disclosed. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Here's my question for you this morning. Where is the mission field of God? is my question for you this morning. I think a lot of times, rightfully so, we talk about outside of these walls. Like when we leave church, we, we enter the mission field. My fellow believers, the mission field is here in this building as well. When the word of God is 
brought forward and brought to bear in our lives. When we share, you know, it's funny, this, the word that it uses here is it says, um, when all prophesy, this idea that, how, how many of you went through the book of Jonah in our summer home groups? Raise your hand if you went through the book of Jonah. All right, I, I love the VeggieTale movie, the uh, Jonah. We actually watched it in our small group. Uh, adults can have fun too. Um, but the funny thing is, is Jonah walked up, he said, and he would always say very cheerfully, a message from the Lord. And it was always a very happy thing. When was the last time you walked into church prepared not only to receive a message from the Lord, but to give one? And folks, that's, that's an interesting question because sometimes you're like, well, that's the pastor's job. Who here has the Holy Spirit in you? All of us. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the gift of bringing a message from the Lord. When was the last time you came expecting to speak life into your neighbor? And I always say this, look at, look at the people around you, other than your spouse, look at someone around you. And what I want you to think about for a second is, would, do you have any reason to be in a building on Sunday morning at 11.30, it's before noon, so you'd probably be napping, do you have any reason to be here other than the gospel of Jesus Christ and the life-changing power that he's given? The answer is most likely not. So here's my question. When we offer genuine worship, when we come to God with our genuine worship, you came in this morning and you offered a sacrifice of praise that's unique to you. These people in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 were offering their praise together. They were bringing the prophecy. They were bringing the words from the Lord. And it said, unbelievers walked in the back, and what happened? It said, suddenly their hearts were laid bare, and they suddenly had a realization of their need for a Savior. When was the last time you viewed your coming to church, your gathering with the saints, as an act of salvation for those that are around you? It is, folks. When we gather in worship, it is an opportunity not just to offer our praise to God, it's an opportunity for people to walk in those doors and say, why are these people here? <laughs> I have no reason to be here. Like, they don't belong together. We have people who work in healthcare fields. We have people who work in, 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 in labor fields. We have people who don't work at all, youth, uh, children. That's right, you, you, you degenerates that don't work. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just, just kidding. Some of you do work. But look around you. We don't belong together apart from the work of Jesus. And when people walk in and see that, when they see the joy that Jamie spoke of, when they see the word of God come forward, should that not bring them to their knees of saying, I need this. I need to fit in somewhere. And I see a bunch of people who don't belong together. Maybe I have a chance. And folks, that's what forsaking of the gathering can do. When we don't gather together, people can't walk in those back doors and say, these people don't belong together. If we don't gather as a church, people can't come and see this. Not that, obviously, the gospel is shared all over, and the mission field is out there. But we need to remember that the mission field also exists in this building. Our children are being taught the Word of God downstairs. The Word of God is being shared to you this morning. Remember, the gathering of the saints is more than just to be in air conditioning. It's more than just to get a, a good show. You know, I, I, love, I love that Jamie said, you know, the, we will, the whole let us rejoice and be glad in it. I love the song, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord had. All right, we all know that, right? And what I love is it says, and I think it is, let us is, is, the, is the verse there. But here's my question. I love in the song that it says, we will rejoice. I refuse to walk into this building and not offer my praise. Because you know what? If you refuse to offer praise to the Lord, what does it say? The rocks will do it for us. I'd rather, the not rocks, I'd rather the rocks not cry out for me. When we gather, it is an opportunity to give praise to the one that is worthy. And folks, that's what I want to do. I want to see people walk in these doors and say, what do these people have that is different? 
And how can I get that? And that's where you come into play. You have to offer your worship. And we, as the pastors, we will offer the word of God. And all we can say is, God, please take that offering and bear lay people's sins to bear in their life, and may we see people come to Christ because we have not forsaken to gather together. May it never be said of Clough that we forsake the gathering together because we desperately need to see people come to Christ, and we need to see them know Jesus as their Savior, and our service to each other is coming together. So hopefully that is another story that we see in the Word of God that it says how important it is that we be here on Sunday mornings. I think about it like this, church. We look in Hebrews and it says that we are not to neglect gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. Here's the truth. There are so many reasons to be in worship every Sunday. It doesn't matter how we feel. We need to be in worship every Sunday. And, and listen, I'm not talking necessarily about when you're on vacation. And I'm not talking to those of you who, guess what? You know, you, you are in a service job and, and there are Sundays where you have to be at the hospital and things like that. I, I'm not talking about that, but I'm as often as we can. If we are in town, if we are able to get out of bed, we need to gather together as the body of Christ here at Clough Pike. There shouldn't be things that hold us back because these things are whispers and they are lies from the devil. How many of you can look back at your last week and say, I, I need an encouragement. I need encouragement this week. Nobody's going to raise their hand. No hand raisers in this church. I got it. There's a few. How many of you say, God did something good in my life this past week? There's reason to celebrate. It's what Jamie was saying. We gather together and we celebrate the goodness of God. How many of you, and this probably one ought to be all of us, say, you know what? I came because I know that I am deficient in and of myself. I need to look more like Jesus. I came to look more like Jesus. I want to leave here. God, I want to leave here looking more like you. I want to leave here looking more like Jesus. How many of you might have come saying together, because here is what that passage in Corinthians uh, that Aaron just read is saying, that when we gather together as the people of God and authentic worship to God, together as the body of Christ, we are declaring the gospel of God that others might receive him as Savior. You know what? Church, I want to see more of that. I want to see more of that too. Now listen, this isn't an exhaustive list. There's so many reasons to come to worship. What I want to share with you is that God wants to do something in our worship. And even as I spoke earlier, you know, it just, it reminds me that when we look at the Bible, it says that if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our heart what God has done through Jesus Christ, that we will be given eternal life. And that eternal life doesn't begin on the day that we die. It begins on the day we confess Jesus as Lord. And here is the truth, church family. We will have all of eternity to worship one who is worthy. To celebrate, to grow more in his likeness, and to declare the good news, right? Glad tidings, great joy together as his people. I love the picture of worship in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 it says this, and after this, after all that had taken place, John writes, and after all of this there was still more to share. There was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. People that maybe didn't belong together, as Aaron said, but were all together in Christ. He says there were so many that nobody can number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. They were there to worship. Can I share something that I shared with you guys a little bit earlier this week? I, I, I want to share it with you, church family, because I think it's just so neat when we think about heaven. 
You know, oftentimes when we think about heaven as the people of God, we mention the mansions, you know, that, that John or that writes that Jesus spoke to his disciples. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. And so we talk about the mansions of, you know, that are going to be in heaven for those who are faithful. It's really kind of a, a neat thought to think about that, the faithfulness of God to deliver us to a place where he is prepared for those who have worshipped him and who have received his gift of salvation. We talk about the streets like gold and the crystal sea, but you know one of the things that has struck out to me, that has just struck my heart as I looked at the book of Revelation, particularly this past week, the vast multitude of people. It doesn't seem to imply that they cared greatly for these mansions, or the streets of gold, or the crystal sea, or the banquet table of the king. When we look at the book of Revelation, we see something that they did care about. They cared about worship. They cared about worshiping the Lamb, the one who was worthy. Verse 10, they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. And I think it's so true and it's such a valid way for us to conclude this morning. Tozer was a theologian and pastor, and he wrote this, I can safely say, and we can agree with him, I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God, that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. Church, we are created to be a people of worship, to celebrate together to repent and receive God's grace, which is new each day, together. To walk out in forgiveness and on mission together. To proclaim the gospel together. We were created to worship. So how do you respond to a message like this? What are, how, do you, how do you respond? What are we to do? Number one, listen, if you walked in the doors today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, one of the things we want to tell you is you were created to worship. You were created. That is why God designed you. That is why God put you together. No matter how you feel about how, who you are or how you might fit, you were created by God and with love and he created you to worship him and to bring glory to him and to have a purpose and a plan that he wants to give your life it is his purpose and his plan for him, right? And if you don't know Jesus, we can start that eternal life discussion that we mentioned. We can start that today. Listen, I know that Jamie and Aaron, we're going to be down here. I guess Aaron, you won't because you'll be playing. But Jamie and I, will we'll come down in just a minute. And if you'd like to know how you can receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we are happy to have that conversation with you this morning. For those of you who are in the room, especially members of Clough Pike, because this is our Clough Life sermon series, who is God calling you to be? Sometimes I think even as believers, even though we know we have received salvation from God, we sometimes just get bored, as A.W. Tozer said. We get our sidetracked. We let other things come before worship. But here's the thing, do we want those other things more than we want what God desires to give us? Joy, peace, do we want it more than becoming more like Jesus? Do we want it more than other people coming to Jesus? It's good reason to regularly be in worship. God wants to do something weekly as we gather together. So I don't know about you, and I'm talking specifically to our church family, but as Aaron plays, we can stand and we can sing, but I want to invite you, whatever you do, to worship. Maybe you come to the altar and you say, you know, I've been coming to church recently, but I haven't been worshiping. Not really. I might even look good on the outside, like Aaron and I do, right? But inside, inside I'm, I'm far from God and I want to get that right this morning. 
You can come and pray. You can stand and sing. You can worship. Because that is what God is calling us to as his people. Let's pray as we begin our time of invitation. that category, God. Lord, I pray that pray that they, you would work on their hearts this morning and that they would receive you. And for the rest of us, God, we're sorry. We're sorry we do not celebrate you the way you deserve to be celebrated. We're sorry that we do not receive your word even as it's preached weekly that we might look more like Jesus each and every time we come. We're sorry we do not come with a heart ready to preach the gospel together as we lift up our hands and our voices in song, as we worship you by receiving your word of truth. God, help us to come this morning to worship. Help us to come next week to worship. Help us to come throughout the rest of this month to worship. Help us to come throughout the rest of this fall to worship. To have a right attitude and a right heart, ready to worship the one true God. God, work in us this morning as we worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
if we leave here this morning, we've said it before, but if we leave here this morning saying, oh, what a great sermon, how great Josh and Aaron looked, and how, you know, good it was to have Jamie preach alongside of them. <laughs> if we leave here this morning saying, what, a, what great music, we loved hearing our band play and sing songs, we failed. The only right response as we gather together is to leave here this morning to say, what great worship, what a great God, and I cannot wait to do it again. You can have a seat as our ushers come forward this morning, share with you a couple of uh, things and ways that uh, you can get plugged into what God is doing here at Clough Pike. Listen, we are a church that is excited to gather together. If you're a guest with us today, listen, we are a church that is excited to gather together. I love being together with my church family. As a matter of fact, you know, as much as my wife loves vacations, and she loves vacations so much that she'll plan your vacation, all right? So, um, you know, I love being, being with my family, but I hate it when I miss, and so I'm looking forward to this fall. I know that summers are a time of vacation, but I'm su just super excited, looking forward to the fall as we continue to gather together to see what God is going to do. I'm really looking forward to Awana kicking off here in just a, a couple of days this coming Wednesday night. We are having family night. So a couple of weeks ago, you saw a little bit of what um, handbook time looks like. We uh, showed you that when we were talking about family ministry in our Clough Life sermon series. This coming Wednesday night, whether you have kids, even if you don't have kids, I invite you to come and to be a part of Awana, okay? So everybody, that means all adults, all children are going to be downstairs youth group. We'll still have youth group, but all adults, all children are going to uh, meet up here. We'll kick off Awana. We'll go downstairs. We're going to be working through some of the different things that your kids, our children at the church are going to be experiencing, and it is really going to be exciting. So I want you to, uh, to really come and be a part of that. Uh, youth, this coming Friday, you guys have a lock-in, right? Because are you not even all excited? Thank you, Nathan. All right. So so how many of you are inviting some friends to our lock-in, right? Got some friends, need to invite. Listen, if you're not inviting friends, we're going to have to find you some friends, all right? That's what we need to do. Youth uh, lock-in coming up on Friday, September 1st. And, uh, and then, listen, a couple other things. First off, we do have a chili-wide bonfire. And, I'm sorry, a church-wide, chili-wide. I like chili-wide, right? It works. A church-wide bonfire and chili cook-off coming up September 30th. It's just going to be a great time of fellowship. And then the last thing, make sure you don't uh, miss this. Uh, moms, we want to uh, talk to you just for a second. We have a young moms ministry that, uh, being host, that is hosting an event uh, next Thursday, September 7th at 7 p.m. in the fellowship hall. So it's not just for young moms. All right, okay, so, so, so that's it's really great. So we have this event. It's going to be a fantastic way for the moms of our church uh, to live out Titus 2 and to be mentors and encouragers to each other. It's next Thursday, September 7th from 7 uh, until 8.30 p.m., and it's going to be in our fellowship hall. So... <laughs> all right yes next thursday night does anybody else have anything to add we're good all right <laughs> so no <laughs> so in all seriousness listen moms uh whether you consider yourself a young mom or an older mom, um, ladies of our church, we are serious about wanting to do 
mom's ministry. It is a time to get together, to encourage one another, because that is what we're supposed to do as the body of Christ. And apparently eat chocolate, um, which I, I, I know that some of you are excited about. So next Thursday, September 7th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m., we invite you. Even if you're not a mom yet, come. It is going to be a great time. I know that it will bless you to be together as a group of ladies from our church. So Thursday, September 7th, 7 to 8.30. And I think with that, um, Julian, are you coming to pray for us? Nathan, are you praying for us? All right. Let's pray. Uh, dear God, I just thank you for today. I just thank you for everyone being here. And I just thank you for Jamie and Pastor Josh and, and Aaron, just, just being able to just give us what we just learned today. And, and um, I also just, I just pray for this offering that it'll just be multiplied in your, in your ways and that it could just be spread across the world for your missions. And in your name I pray, amen. Worship. Everybody worships. Everyone, everywhere worships something. Whatever captivates the heart's affections, the mind's attention, and the soul's ambition essentially has our worship. We worship everything from pop icons to our jobs to our favorite sports team. While the object and method of worship vary, the act of worship does not. Oftentimes, our worship is focused on ourselves. The pursuit of fame, wealth, and personal satisfaction becomes the focus of our wants and desires, but no matter how much we worship these things, they can never satisfy the deepest longings of our soul. God has uniquely designed us with meaning and purpose. He's divinely created us in his own image. When we worship the created and not the creator, we are left unfulfilled and unsatisfied. We deny God the worship that is rightfully his. When we step into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus, our relationship with God should become elevated above every other ambition, every other affection, and every other activity. It should change everything we do. It begins to change the words we say, the decisions we make, the way we view our circumstances and see the people around us. It changes our goals, desires, and pursuits. Instead of searching for meaning and purpose in our life, it becomes the meaning and purpose of our life. Worshiping God is not limited to singing a song on Sunday morning. It's a lifestyle lived out in reverence to God wherever he has placed you. There is no sacred and secular divide. Worship involves all of our lives, not just one part. Not just one part. That means we worship as we work, as we parent, as we go to school, as we gather around the table, as we suffer, as we compete, as we love, as we seek, as we create. All that we believe, think, say, and do should flow from our beating heart of worship. So what is worship? It's the outpouring of our lives, led by the Spirit and rooted in God's truth, devoting all we are and all we do to Him, our Creator. It's ascribing worthiness to the one who alone is worthy. So, will you worship? Not just today. We want you to worship today. We want you to not forsake this. But will you worship? And that's not a, there, there, I can't say will you worship this week. Will you worship in general? Will you offer your life for the Lord? And that's the question for us this morning as we prepare to leave. So let's all stand and we're going to sing of our God one more time. We're going to sing how good he is.
I, I did. I imagine that, right? So, listen, I want to invite uh, uh, Tara Rosma and our college students to come up here for a second, okay? Um, so, tonight, or today, rather, is uh, Tara's last Sunday, and uh, we are so thankful for her and Bobby and how they have poured in to our college students over the, the past little bits, past couple years. And um, they have... They have led our uh, College and Career Sunday School. They have planned events, and I know most of y'all, uh, one of your favorite things is they feed you every Sunday, right? And uh, we are so, so grateful uh, for how God has used them here at Clough Pike. We're excited uh, for what's next for them as they move to Texas, and uh, both are, Bobby's already down there, but tackling uh, new jobs and uh, new opportunities, and, and so this isn't just, you know, uh, hey, you're leaving. This is us. We want to send you out knowing that God's going to use you wherever um, he takes you, and so we're so grateful for you. We want you to know that. And um, listen, church family, um, I know that's one of the practices of the church is they'll just lay hands on people, especially as uh, we send them out. I just want to ask if you will, if you feel comfortable, just go ahead and stretch your hands uh, towards Tara. Know that Bobby's already in Texas, but he's an introvert and wouldn't want to do this anyway. <laughs> And, uh, but just stretch your hands towards Tara. College students, if you will lay hands on Tara, we're going to pray for Tara and Bobby as uh, God takes them and sends them to a new mission field in Texas. Father God, we come to you. We are so grateful for the people that you send our way. We're so grateful to have had uh, Tara and Bobby these past several years be a part of our Clough Pike Church family. And we know, Lord, that uh, no matter where they go or what they're doing, they, we will always consider them part of our family. God, not only are they part of the family of heaven, but they are part of a family who have won our hearts, who have won our affections, and we are truly grateful for everything that you have done with them, how they have loved on our college and career students, and um, Lord, how you have used them to shape them into young men and women who are seeking you more today than they were when they entered into our college and career ministry. God, we know that you um, have big plans for Tara and Bobby. We see their hearts to serve you, their hearts to worship you, their hearts to love you, and their hearts to love others because of you. God, we pray that you would keep them safe as they go. Lord, as they settle into uh, a new home, Lord, we pray that you would bless them. As they work to find a new church family, we pray that you would give them success, not in just finding any church, but finding the church that you want them to be a part of, or the church that you want to use them to be your hands and your feet, your words, your mouth, to encourage people. Lord, I know that they've done that for us, and we pray that you will use them greatly to continue to do that and so much more as they leave on this journey, taking next steps in their lives. God, we are so grateful uh, for what you have done in our church through Bobby and Tara. We just ask that you would bless them as they leave here. Lord, today and uh, even as we our paths cross again, continue to bless them. We love you and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So. All right. With that being said, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We love you. Uh, join us for worship again next week or Awana on Wednesday. Y'all are dismissed.